Welcome to the Spunky Spirit Podcast. I'm your host, psychic medium, Carrie Muggs. This is where we learn all things spirit, everything from spiritual gifts, awakenings, ghosts, aliens, and starseeds. Nothing is untouchable, but always fun and spunky. I am honored to be on this spiritual journey with you, so make sure you hit the subscribe button so you never miss an episode. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Spunky Spirit. Today, we're going to be talking about remote viewing. And I love this because it's just, everyone can do it. It's it's the government's been trying to, the government has in the past done some stuff with psychic, with remote viewing, and they have trained people to remote view, people who aren't intuitive, people who, who didn't believe in this stuff. They just would train them. And they even, one of their best remote viewers was a man named Patrick Price, who we'll talk about later, and he was a policeman, and they pulled him into a a thing called Stargate, a program that they were working on about mind control, and he became one of their best um, remote viewers, and he wasn't even even an, an intuitive. He would, didn't believe in the psychic abilities and things like that, so it's pretty interesting. Psychic remote Remote viewing is when it's a practice when people can see impressions about a distant or unseen object or place. So typically the remote viewer is expected to give information about an object or an event or a person or a location that is hidden from physical view or separated distance. So sometimes forensic psychics will use remote viewing, trying to see or locate where a missing person is. And sometimes, you know, this is a little different than mediumship. Sometimes I feel like sometimes when I do readings, um, a a spirit can come through and they can try and show me like this is the hospital room that I passed in. This is what it looked like. Or this is what my bedroom looks like. This is what my house looks like. This is what the house I grew up looks like. That's a little bit different because I feel like the spirit's trying to show me clairvoyantly. Um, Remote viewing is when you sit and you try and picture different places or you see a different place and you or see see different time periods or see something see something that is in a different area. And I this is my favorite because anybody can do it. You just need to practice. And it just goes to show that we all are intuitive. We all have intuitive abilities. Some of us are just like better at it than others, but it's because of the practicing, right? It's because it's the practicing. And I really feel like to do, um, I thought to do remote viewing, you had to use your clairvoyance, which is your vision. But there's some different remote viewings on here that they talk about that you don't have to use just your vision. It is good, but there's a certain kind of remote viewing that they talk about that you can, you're being interviewed and the first thing that comes to your mind. So we'll kind of talk about that in just a, in just a minute. But so anybody can do it. Anybody can, med- and can, can remote view. And I'm going to give you some practicing tips towards the end of this episode. But mostly too, they said that the best ones in the classes that they would train were the ones who would continually meditate or be consistent at practicing. So meditation is huge. And I remember when I would meditate for my gift or when I would meditate, you know, before readings, I will a lot of times see during my meditation some of the things that happen or some of the things that we're going to talk about in the reading. So when I used to, and also too, I would have visions, like spirit would show me visions or different things during the meditation. And then I would be scrolling Facebook or I'd be driving down the street and I would see what they showed me. It was kind of like a, a training, I guess, that spirit would put me through so that they could practice on my clair, they could practice on my clairvoyance or practice me seeing these different places. So, and they also said in remote viewing trainings that it took anywhere, like at first, they weren't very great, but it took anywhere from 25 to 30 times of practicing before they started to get really good. So it takes a lot of time. It takes consistency. It's not something you're going to be able to do overnight, but it's worth it. And I just am so interested in it. The reason why I got interested in it is because I was reading about a program the CIA did called Stargate. And the reason why I love that, if you guys have listened to me enough, you know that I love the show Stargate. I love thinking that there's these portal rings 
out there that you can walk through and go to different dimensions or different planets or things like that. So one day I'll do an episode on on something like that. But the Stargate program by the CIA was a program during the Cold War trying to get, we were trying to get ahead of the Soviet Union and we were training using mind control or ESPN or um, we explored reading thoughts, telepathy, predictions, remote viewing. They said it was terminated in 1995, but it's been kind of proven that I still believe it's still going, but other places or other, um, gosh, you know, when I do these podcasts, I lose my train of train of thought or but so when I say other places other countries other countries still use or practice ESPN or remote viewing and one of the biggest or one of the best remote viewers was a man named Patrick Price he was a policeman and he was an extraordinary accurate um, remote viewer and he he was one of the best, and the, he worked with the government on the Stargate project and on another one too, another project. But and he was most known for his remote viewing session that he included sketches of a USSR facility during the Cold War, and he was so accurate. He was so accurate in what they were doing, and they they found out later that it was exactly what he had seen. So some people think that um, he was so accurate and so good at it that he became a liability he became a, a liability and he was um, they were scared that he would go to different countries or become because it's technically right it's technically a spy you're being a spy for your country or whatever so some people think that he actually was killed he died of a heart attack but some people think he was killed with a heart attack gun which is not it's just a, a gun that has a laser on it that you can shoot somebody. You can point it at somebody and it can cause a heart attack. I don't know if those actually exist, but you know this podcast. Anything is, it. you know, open your mind to anything. So I thought that that was kind of cool. Some of his, um, one of his most known was, most known viewings was one of an alien ship or one of aliens. So in... There's a book called, and I'll put a list of different books at the show notes in this podcast that you can find about remote viewers. But in the book written in 19, 1997 by, um, oh, I forgot his name. Anyways, there was a book. It's called, I'll put it down. It's The Secret History of American Psychic Spies. Oh, it's by Jim Schnabel. And he describes in detail the involvement of the U.S. intelligence in um it's kind of like psychic espionage, like psychic spies. And it began in the 1970s and he dedicated a whole section to Pat Price. And so Pat Price was like, he, it was like an extraordinary psychic spy. And he said, Patrick, Pat Price said that in Alaska, then in the, in the mountains of Mount Hayes, there in the Anchorage, in Anchorage, I'm trying to read this too. There is a large secret base of aliens, which is kind of crazy. According to Price, the aliens who lived inside the mountain were very similar to humans in appearance, differing only in the internal anatomy, such as the heart, the lungs, and the blood and the eyes. Price also stated that the aliens were able to take control of our mind and that Alaska, the Alaska site was also responsible for malfunction of some of American and Soviet space projects. Um, they were never confirmed, of course. However, if they were, we don't know about it. And despite the controversial nature of the story, some recently publicized FBI files we read are surprising encounters with UFOs period between those times, 1947 and 1950 in Alaska. He also talked about having... Um, a view where he saw he was at a place on an alien ship or an alien planet and he talked about how he saw that they hold would hold the human soul so I thought that was kind of interesting too so as you can see that's why I love the remote viewing because not only do they see into the government things um, different places we also see like into different planets different things and it's just so fascinating to me. And 
he was the most, Pat Price was the most successful viewer. And there was another thing called Ingo Swan, that remote viewing heading was in the American military. So you might want to look up that too. His sessions were constantly accurate and he was um, just known as being like the most accurate, one of the most accurate um, remote viewers there were. So I thought that was kind of interesting that we as a government used, used it and they say we don't anymore, but I really, really think that we do. So that's just kind of my thought or my two cents on it. But also Edgar Casey would use remote viewing in some of his things and his, he would be able to very accurately tell people where the best place to drill for oil was. But the crazy thing is, is when he started to do it for himself, he couldn't, he wasn't accurate. So that kind of also goes into the fact that what you're actually using your gifts for, like it to better I mean, you can use your gifts to better serve you and to help you with your awakening and your spiritual connection. But also, too, I feel like when it starts to get greedy like that, maybe, I don't know. That's all about manifesting. I don't know. I kind of have second thoughts about that, too, because I do believe it's just, I guess, our intention. If our intention is greed and to get rich quick, that's different. But if our intention is to help others and to help with our spiritual connection, I think that's different too. So there are different kinds of remote viewing. And one of them is called associative, which the, you associate something that you can see with your target. So when they were doing these trainings, they were told the word target. So once they said the word target, then it's kind of like when I do a reading and I say the prayer of protection. Once I say the prayer of protection, it just, spirit knows I'm ready. I am ready to do my reading. And I kind of, I go and I sit in the power at that time as soon as the prayer of protection is over. I've even gotten to the point where I'm pretty much, I can pretty much not connect and I don't have spirits bugging me all the time until I say that prayer protection spirit knows that I'm ready. I've created those boundaries. So they kind of did this when they trained them and they taught them the word. When they said target, they automatically went into that sitting in the power, automatically went into their psychic connection or their remote viewing connection. So when they associate something that you can see with your target. So I think that they knew what they were looking at. Like I think Patrick knew he was looking, I think, when they say you associate it with your target, I think, but I could be wrong, that it means that he knew he was trying to look at a Soviet building or a place, or he knew he was trying to, he knew what the target was going to be. And that is called associate, um, associative remote viewing. Controlled remote viewing is when you just use your intuition and you don't really know what the target is. You just kind of go into your session and you come to what first is on what comes first through to your mind and I think that that's more controlled and people are like you know and this is what the government did they did they did associative and they did it all of the remote viewing in a controlled setting um, not just kind of free free will in it I think they kind of did it in a controlled setting and then there's extended remote viewing this is the one where I was telling you that they the remote viewer lays down or is sitting comfortably and somebody, they they think about the target and then somebody asks them questions or interviews them about the target and the, the person who's doing the remote viewing asks the, I mean, answers the questions that, with the first thing that comes to their mind. So this to me is also more intuitive, I think. It's not, I think there's, it's all intuitive, right? It's it's all intuitive, but I think that there's some psychic remote viewing and then also too there's some spirit answering question or questions and are you tapping into the the un, the vortex or the you know the collective, the thought of all the the records, the Akashic records or the the Oh gosh, what do I want to call it? I should take better notes so I can not forget words, but I kind of ramble sometimes. And so I want to talk about, but the, the, the stream, you know, I've talked about it before, the collective stream of art of, the, and, and, of intelligence, that, that, that 
collective intelligence that everything is written in the Akashic Records. And sometimes I think you can tap into that and use remote viewing too. So I think the more you practice, the the better you get. And there have been some some really cool things that some of the most like outlandish, outrageous things that have happened from remote viewers that, that remote viewers have claimed to see. So, um, in 1978, the go- U.S. government thought remote viewing was intriguing enough to investigate it, obviously. And so, some of the things that came out of it, and also too, did you know that the the movie the the Men Who Stare at Goats was kind of about this a little bit? Through many of the events in the film, were they, they were fiction. But it was talking about the existence of a program of this, like, mind control. And I've never seen that movie, but I'm going to think, I think I might go watch it just to see, um, to see what's, what it's like. They said the program was discontinued and declassified in 1995, but because they said it wasn't useful. But I don't believe that's entirely true. So in 1975... Ingo Swan remote viewer from the original CIA program. Now, I don't really know what Ingo Swan is. I know what Stargate is because I love the word Stargate, but so that might be something Ingo Swan, I N G O Swan. Um, they made another, somebody was doing remote viewing for them and they claimed that when they were given the coordinates to find a Russian submarine, so like this would be the associative one, they were given coordinates of where to look and, um, so the remote viewer was looking, he said, oh my God, I think that this submarine was shot down by a UFO or a UFO fired on her. And so that was never proven, obviously, but it's, you know, because the government hides this stuff sometimes. So, And some remote viewers say they can see, they use their abilities to see things distance, like in the future. So a lot of this is like fortune telling, future stuff. Um, Nostradamus was one of these. He could he could use remote viewing to see into the future. And um, Gene Nicolay is one of the remote viewers. He said he claims that companies and governments have hired him for his predictions, and he's made some extraordinary predictions. He um, he one of his production one of his predictions included a global currency reset in 2017 and 2019. And he also has predicted the destruction of Rome in the year 2030. And he also predicted that that there's going to be an American civil war in 2035. And these books are, these predictions are in his book called Timeline Collapse and Universal Ascension. So I'll probably, I'll put that in the show notes too and see if I can, if that book's available. Also, there was a remote viewer who correctly identified one of the kidnappers of Patty Hearst. So wealthy, you know, when Patty Hearst was, when she was kidnapped, she was violently kidnapped from her home. I think this was in 1974 and, um, by a cult and they wanted to brainwash wash her and enlist her into a lot of their crimes. And after this, the Berkeley police were still in the dark and they didn't know where she was. And they had a remote viewer who was one of the remote viewers from the CIA program named Russell Targ. And he used remote viewing and he was the first one to correctly identify the kidnapping car and one of the kidnappers. So that is pretty cool too. Um... Another remote viewer named Major Ed Dames, one of the original students of the Stargate project, said not to only have extraterrestrial exist, but they are actually collaborating with humans to stop nuclear war. And he said this on a Coast to Coast radio show. He described UFOs that were reported actively shutting down the U.S. Trident nuclear missile tests. When the Pentagon asked him if he could get any intelligence from remote viewing, he said his remote viewers claimed that this was claimed that these were not craft but plasma balls being controlled by both extraterrestrials and humans that were not born on this planet. So that's kind of cool. That goes kind of into the star seed thing that there's humans and they're not just on this planet. So take what you want on that one. That one's kind of cool. There was a remote viewer that actually predicted the ring around Jupiter. Um, 
they, the CIA also has a free remote viewing program. One of its remote viewers in the Ingo Swan one remoted that he saw the perimeter of Jupiter and predicted that there was going to be a faint ring around the planet, something our telescopes were unable to detect back then. And when they did a flyby of Jupiter in 1973, they confirmed that, yes, there was a ring around the planet. So um, also like there was one about one of the most experienced remote viewers claims that he saw structures and humanoids on the far side of the moon. As he put it, I found towers, machinery, lights, buildings, humanoids busy working on something I couldn't figure out. Although by the time he saw this, he says the intelligence community already knew about it, which is crazy because my husband was just showing me a thing yesterday about Neil Armstrong landing on the moon, and we only see one side of the moon. We don't ever see the other side, and that they claimed, the conspiracy theorists claimed that there's a lot of other things on the other side of the moon, so I thought that was kind of cool that that came, um, came up too while I was doing my research for this for this um, pro- for this episode, in 1980, Joe McMeagle had another success when he his services were used by the CIA to determine how a captured KGB agent in South Africa had communicated with the Soviet Union. With zero knowledge of the man, McCogney, I think it's McCog McMeagle said to look in his pocket calculator, which which the agent used frequently after investigating after investigating it agents found the calculator the calculator concealed a short wave radio so this was all from just remote viewing so i thought that was really interesting because this is i think more of where you know there's kind of a fine line between mediums and remote viewing i think it it's kind of all entwined like they a, they make it seem like it's different like mediums Mediums do contact people on the other side who have passed over, but psychic and mediums can also use remote viewing. Anybody can use remote viewing. And I think that that's, that's so interesting. And I think the key is the meditation. I really think that, you know, meditation is huge. So those were the predictions. And I just love that everyone can do it. So here's ways that you can practice remote viewing. Um, you or a friend, you have a friend, select a different different targets. So the targets would be different pictures of different objects or different places, places um, about four or five of them, and have them each put in a different manila envelope. And then you you know, after you meditate, you put, you put them in the envelope and then you quiet your mind. So this would be the meditation. I think before you quiet your mind though, you do a let go or a dump. And that is when you write down everything that's bugging you for the day or everything that's like right before I do a reading, I have to take everything that is worried me or everything that's going on in my life. And I have to imagine it, putting it in a bag and then me taking the bag and putting it outside the read- my reading room. And I think that this is the same thing. They say to do like kind of a, you write down, and this is what they would do in the trainings. They would have everybody write down all the things that was that were bugging them for the day or things that were on their mind, like even things like I have to clean the car, I have to do, you know, the dishes, things like that, and write them down. And then you take that piece of paper up and you crumble it and you throw it away. So it releases, it's just kind of a mind dump. You release that and you let it go. So then you clear your mind, you quiet your mind, you kind of get into a meditative state, like you kind of fill out one or you feel relaxed. And then you write the first thing that comes to your mind. Now, when you're in a meditative state, you don't always have to be shut your eyes and and be in a quiet place. I sit in the power while I do readings and I'm in a meditative state, but my eyes are open and I do scribble and I do focus. This is why automatic writing is so important. It's part of this too. It's so interesting how some of it all just connects. They're all different things, but they all connect and help each other and they help with each other. So automatic automatic writing is huge for this. So you could just write down the first things that come to your mind. And when you do this, describe the basics. Don't be like yellow Ford car. You just say a car 
I see a car. Or you say, I see yellow. You do, you just do the basics at first. Once you start doing it more, you'll get used to it and you can see more details. But if you see, um, like if you see um, a big land of water or an ocean, don't say the Pacific Ocean, just say ocean, land of water. And this is so cool too, because I you do this process in my readings and sometimes I can be like, okay, I see an ocean and I'll ask this, I'll ask the spirit, is this California? Is this Hawaii? Is this? And so you kind of can get it down. Um, now imagine being in front of whatever the object is and just know too, like the first things that come to your mind, I want you to write those down and I want you to just kind of stack that information. But also too, these, these visions are going to come to you like memories, not like just wham, bam. They're going to come to you kind of muggy and foggy and that's okay because you're practicing and they kind of always will. Like some of my, when I do readings and I compare this a lot to when I do readings, you know, I have to really focus on the details that they're trying to show me because they do come through like their memories or memories and not just like super crispy, clear and very, very accurate. You have to work on that. Um, and then also too, when you imagine being in front of it, then write some more description, write what you think it is. Is it round? Is it a ball? Is it a place? Is it, you know, in nature kind of decide. And when you do the four pictures, make sure they're all kind of different, different pictures. Um, then mostly let go of being right. You don't have to be right all the time. And this is what I tell my students all the time. Let go of being right. And also too, this is perfect for, I have an awakening class. And if you want to try and connect and work on these and you learn about the Claire's and how to and how to do that and all of that, my awakening class would be perfect for this because it does show, it does kind of talk about the basics of trying to connect, the basics of psychicness. So, and that is on my website. You get eight weeks of just different, uh, every week you get a different um, theme or a different um category that you go over with and you practice those and you do the homework and you and you do that for that week and then next week it'll bring something through. I do it every week because you need time to practice it. I don't want you to rush through it. There's stuff about the chakras, there's stuff about the clairs, there's practicing practicing, seeing, and your different clairs. And clairvoyance would be a really good one to use for this project. So now that is in a nutshell, how you practice about, how you practice with remote viewing. I think the most important thing is being consistent and practicing on almost like a daily basis, really. Like you'd have to practice, I mean, just even if you do like a five minute meditation or a little bit of a meditation every day and you just kind of practice, you can also do this with um, cards if you don't have if you don't have someone to help you or a partner to help you, you can pull a deck of cards out and pull three cards out that you don't know what they are and just kind of stare at them and try and guess or imagine or remote view and see which card it is. So lots and lots of practice, but I've always told you always that this stuff takes lots of practice all the time. So I just thought remote viewing is awesome and interesting and it goes so much with psychic and I, it's something I want to start practicing or I want to start trying to, you know, look, obviously I want to just see how good, you know, you can be at it, but, and it's so interesting because when you see the different ways that you can do the remote viewing and different books, it just, it's like going down this this rabbit hole. So I will list some of the books for you and um, on, on the show notes. And I hope you guys, I hope you guys really enjoyed this. If you did enjoy this, please share it with others because it opens such a big worm, like a, a big hole of other things, other things that besides remote viewing, like Stargate and government and and mediumship and all of that stuff. It just is, and UFOs and aliens and all that kind of stuff. It's just kind of the tip of the iceberg and, and espionage. And it's just so fun for me. I love it. So hope that helps you guys. I love you guys so much. Please check out my Patreon. 
All my Patreon people get first dibs on all of my courses, all of my things that are coming. My mediumship course is coming online. It's not just going to be um, available in person. It's going to be available online. And also, too, I want you to watch out for, I am doing spirit circles. Right now, I'm doing them in person, but I will start doing those online, too. My retreat is sold out. Thank you guys so much. But I love you guys so much, and I will talk to you next week. If you love this podcast, please share it with others. 